Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. And welcome to the Land Dialogue webinar series, organized in partnership with the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Thank you for joining us. My name is Thin, and I'm a journalist specializing in food systems and climate change, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's session, which is on carbon markets and indigenous lands, the importance of free, prior and informed consent. Now, the idea behind these webinar series is to raise awareness on the land rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, because we believe that these rights are a prerequisite to achieve national and international goals on key issues like forest governance, food security, climate mitigation, economic development, and of course, human rights. And this is our third land dialogue for this year, and we have focused on different topics. We're going to have one more in December before COP28. Now, before we start the webinar proper, let me just go through some housekeeping rules. The webinar today is mainly in English and Spanish, but we have simultaneous translations also in French and Portuguese. Now, to access the translation, all you need to do is just go to the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. You click on it, and then you can select the language that you want. This webinar will last 60 minutes. We have set aside about 15 minutes for Q&A, so if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box to pose them, not the chat box. But please do use the chat box to introduce us where you are from, which organization you belong to. You could also tweet using the hashtag Len Dialogues in one word, and you can also follow the live tweeting from the Land Portal and Tenure Facility Twitter accounts, or maybe I should say X accounts. And finally, we're also recording today's session and we will be sharing the links later. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's turn to the topic at hand, which is on carbon markets. Now, this is a fascinating, but also a controversial topic. And it's very, very timely, given that there is the climate week in New York coming up next week. And I think that's also why we have such high interest in this webinar. We already have more than 300 people joining us you know, right now. Now, some see carbon markets as a key fight against climate change that's going to be also providing much needed financing to save our forests, which are carbon sinks. Now, others think that they're a tool for greenwashing, or worse, they're going to dispossess indigenous and local communities. The thing is, a lot of us don't fully understand how carbon markets work and see them as complex financial instruments, or at least I do. So we want to demystify them a little bit. And that's why we have a slightly different format today. So we're first going to have an overview of carbon markets from an academic expert. And then we're gonna have a panel discussion with three indigenous leaders about their experiences on the ground when it comes to carbon markets. And now let me introduce you to our speakers in alphabetical order. We have Levi Sucre Romero, who is the coordinator of the Mesoamerican Alliance of Peoples and Forests. Now this alliance represents indigenous peoples and local communities in the territories between Panama and Mexico. Levy is an indigenous Bribri Costa Rican and also the co-chair of the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities. Next, we have Marco Chavez Coyjoy, who is the coordinator of the legal department of the Community Forestry Association of Guatemala Utsche. Now, Marco is a member of the Mayaquiche community. of the Tupac Amaru Indigenous community. And last, but definitely not the least, we have Catherine Lofts, Senior Research Associate with the Canada Research Chair in Human Rights, Health and the Environment at McGill University. Now, Catherine is a lawyer by training and has worked on the intersection of climate change, human rights and environmental governments for over a decade. And she's going to set the scene for this discussion today by bringing us up to speed on what's happening with carbon markets. Catherine, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Thin. Um, it's really a pleasure to be a part of today's dialogue and to participate alongside these remarkable Indigenous leaders who will be sharing their own experiences and their expertise. Um, this is a very big topic, so I'm going to dive right in, beginning with the question of what exactly carbon markets are. So simply defined, a carbon market is a trading system in which carbon credits are sold and bought. And these carbon credits are generated through entities such as communities uh, or states, um, um, and it, they're generated when these entities remove or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, for example, through renewable energy projects, um, through Red Plus projects, and so forth. So companies or individuals or other entities can then purchase these carbon credits through the carbon market and can use them uh, to compensate for or offset their own greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are two main types of carbon markets. The first is uh, the compliance markets, and these are created and regulated by mandatory carbon reduction schemes in certain jurisdictions. Um, and then there are the voluntary carbon markets. These enable companies and individuals to purchase credits on a voluntary basis. So that is an extremely uh, short definition of sort of what carbon markets are really in a nutshell. Um, so we can see that many countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are now poised to implement their own Red Plus programs and projects and other land-based initiatives that are aiming to remove, reduce, and avoid uh, carbon emissions, thus generating credits and generating offsets for the carbon market. And as then mentioned, there, there has been tremendous interest and a tremendous amount of investment in these so-called um, nature-based solutions. So countries and corporations around the world are really looking to these kinds of programs and these kinds of initiatives to help them meet their own um, emission reduction targets and their own net zero commitments. Um, there are a few, um, as then mentioned, major issues um, with this, and I'm just going to be able to briefly outline these here. Um, the first issue is that many of the credits that are being generated and that are being traded on the carbon market are simply not doing what they claim to do. So we've seen recently, for example, um, research that's come out showing that there's evidence that vast numbers of these carbon uh, credits are actually not doing anything to mitigate climate change. Um, many of them are actually bogus, essentially. So um, this is pretty much, uh, this is a pretty fundamental issue about the effectiveness of carbon markets. But the, a second issue, which is the one that I want to focus more on here, is in relation to the rights of Indigenous peoples um, and local communities. So to date, most of these interventions, um, most of these land-based mitigation initiatives have taken place in areas that are customarily held by Indigenous peoples, local communities, and Afro-descendant peoples. So the majority of these lands where these projects and initiatives are taking place are indigenous and community lands. And we know that indigenous peoples and local communities around the world have long been the stewards of forests um, and of other ecosystems. Yet around the world, only about half of the areas that are held by indigenous peoples and local communities have actually been legally recognized by governments. So we have all of this action now, this interest and investment, in these projects that are taking place on land that is customarily held by and stewarded by Indigenous peoples and local communities, but it, that is not actually legally recognized as such. Um, and even in cases where land rights are acknowledged, the rights to the carbon that is stored on those lands and stored in those forests um, and the rights to the tradable emissions reductions that come from that carbon are very seldom explicitly defined in law. So the legal frameworks are simply not in place to manage and address this trade in carbon. And ultimately this failure to adequately recognize the rights of indigenous peoples and the role that they play in global climate mitigation poses major, major risks, not only for the indigenous peoples and the local communities themselves, but also for investors, for governments, um, and for the very success of these schemes. Um, despite the large number of indigenous rights that we see um, that are clearly set out and established under international law, we aren't seeing that those rights are being robustly upheld in the context of the carbon market. Um, and this includes the right to self-determination, um, land and resource rights, rights to participation and consultation, and of course, the right to free prior and informed consent. In, in too many cases, indigenous peoples and local communities are not being treated as equal partners. Um, 
Of course, we are seeing a tremendous amount of mobilization around these issues on the part of indigenous peoples and local communities themselves and at many levels from the local to the transnational, including across Asia, Africa and Latin America. And this is something that I'm sure the other panelists will be in a much better position to speak to. Um, so I'm going to stop here. I I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussion from the other speakers and their views on what's happening in their communities. And of course, I'm available for questions um, at the question period. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine, for this concise but info-packed introduction. I know we gave you an impossible task, giving you like five minutes to try and sum up carbon markets, but really appreciate you doing that. And also for mentioning, of course, Asia and Africa, because, you know, we have a lot of Indigenous leaders present today, but um, this mainly from South America, but this is a global issue that affects other parts of the world as well. Now that we know what carbon markets are and what are some of the big problems. We're going to hear from indigenous communities who are seeing how this work and you know how this work firsthand in their communities. We're going to try and fit in three rounds of questions in the next half an hour. So we would really appreciate if our speakers could keep their answers precise and not more than three minutes for each answer. And we would also like to ask them to speak slow so that our interpreters can actually understand and be able to translate them as accurately as possible. Again, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. Now I'm going to turn to the panelists and for this round, I would like to hear from you your experience so far to date with carbon markets. Have they worked? Have they not worked? How has it been? Um, Levy, can I start with you first? Because if I'm not wrong, you have been working on carbon markets for decades in Costa Rica, right? Gracias, Tin. Efectivamente, como tengo. Thank you very much, Tin. You already introduced me, so I won't do that again. I am a Bribri indigenous person from Costa Rica, and since 1997, the indigenous people, we have been working at a national level for a carbon trading system. This allowed us to work on creating a national network strategy that included previous uninformed consent and created the prerequisite in our country so that Costa Rica today is able to create more investment for more funding for forests through the carbon market, taking into account the necessary prerequisite national for national and uh, forest protection so that we can participate in national carbon and in international carbon trading. Of course, this is a complex topic and, and globally, some of the strategies have failed because the prerequisites haven't been fulfilled. These prerequisites require the free informed consent and of the indigenous people. And this is something that many countries have not have not uh, done. So this created a fracture in the market. There's an initiative that is trying to cover what the network hasn't done with the high integrity carbon trading. And there's another line that's just even scamming communities without any control in the trading. So we do believe that certification could be an alternative, but even then certifications haven't made it possible to solidify indigenous people's rights in the carbon market. And as a region, we are worried with certification and we are really working on it. 
I, I will I do not have the time to present our strategy, but I will try to explain it in the next questions. We are still vulnerable in front of carbon incentives. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, uh, Levi. Um, and, um, you know, you mentioned the free prior informed consent being crucial and, and how that is still not available. That's going to be the next question where we will, you know, dive deep into this, this issue. Marco, I want to actually come to you next um, to hear your thoughts on, on and your experiences on carbon markets. Marco? Muy buenos días. Muchas Good gracias. morning. Thank you very much for this space. Thank you, Then, Well, from Guatemala's perspective, especially when it comes to the participation of local communities and indigenous peoples, there have been some efforts, especially promoted from the articulation of regional and local spaces. These spaces, for example, the Mesoamerican Alliance of Peoples and Forests was one of them. And some other efforts made by community organizations. For example, the organization Uche from Guatemala that I represent, which looks to bring communities real and critical informations, information on the progress of climate finance, including carbon markets. The dialogue, construction, and proposals directed by communities and indigenous peoples towards global climate finance must be heard. The challenge is really that the voices of these communities and peoples are legitimately heard, but also taken into consideration. And that's where the uh, pre the prior consult and uh, informed consent comes into play. And sometimes they are not promoted by the states. They usually privilege and prioritize personal and sectorial interests. Currently, indigenous communities do not, communities in Guatemala do not prioritize information on copper markets. And this is because they have to meet basic needs, such as access to land, education, health, and conditions for a dignified life that are not yet guaranteed. So I believe that the efforts must be greater concerning the access, the access of land and carbon markets. The carbon markets from the thematic approach still has to face these historical conditions. And they have to take into consideration these matters to meet needs. Communities still need information and they must be taken into consideration and must be must have direct participation in decision making processes. And not only the dialogues, but they also have to integrate their interest concerning the historical matters of indigenous peoples. Thank you. Gracias, Marco. Um, it, it sounds like, you know, there's this massive power and information imbalance is one of the big challenges um, that is that, that that's there at the moment when it comes to carbon markets. I've also just been told that we also have interpretation in Bahasa Indonesia. So if you need um, to listen to this webinar in Bahasa Indonesian, just go to the little globe icon below and click on that. Um, now, Marisol, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on carbon markets. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for this space. Well, to tell you about the Quechua, the Quechua situation, the Quechua people situation here in Santa Martin region in Peru, there are two protected areas. One, the Cordillera Azul Park, and the other one is called the National Service Cerro Escalera. Concerning the Cordillera Azul National Park, carbon markets have been sold since 2014. But the issue here is that 
first, we didn't have information first. Second, we weren't the decision makers. Who those are sold to? Nothing. We weren't part of the advisory council either. Nothing at all. We were basically excluded totally when it comes to the decision making. And we had to go to the transparency court here in Peru to have access to the information, who the, they were sold to and what is being generated from that sold, from that sale. So we found that the main buyers were Shell, Total Energy Company. And the most ironic thing here is out of these millionaires sales is that we are the ones safeguarding and protecting our territories. And we are the ones doing the constant monitoring of the area, um, systems of alert. And out of those, because of doing those efforts, we are being punished, we are being criminalized, we are being persecuted. There is a great level of violence towards indigenous peoples because of making these issues visible only. We don't receive absolutely anything out of these sales of carbon market credits because we have we don't have titles yet. And the park calls us neighbors. And because of that, we cannot receive any benefits because of those sales. But how can, because we are the ancestral stewards of these lands and we don't receive any benefit, benefits of it. We do the territorial monitors and monitoring and for doing that, we need some resources, medicine and so forth. And we do this, we receive this, not because of the sales of carbon market credits. So we are so concerned because first we think that the sales of credit, carbon credits, carbon market, uh, market credit carbons are not enough and are, are fake because it's true that indigenous peoples have some do documents about protected areas, but those documents ignore and make rights of indigenous peoples in that area vulnerable. And we are very concerned because we would like to be part of the group of decision makers and really do a due process on who the, car the carbon credits are being sold to. Thank you so very much. Um, gracias, Marisol. Now that I have you here, I would actually like you to um, begin the second round of questions. Um, and this specifically looks into the free prior and informed consent, because, you know, just listening to all three of you, it's very, very clear that, you know, governments, state agencies, and maybe the private sector as well are actually failing in this bit, which everybody says is, is, is crucial. You're not, you know, benefiting from carbon markets as, 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 as they are at the moment. Part of the reason, of course, it has to do with titling and rights, but also just the lack of information. Um, can you tell us why, you know, the free prior and informed consent is important? And do you have any examples or instances whether its presence or absence has had a significant difference in outcomes for projects? And actually, I just also saw that there is a question in the Q&A, which I think is, is linked to that. So I think um, how, you know, how, if you have any examples of any successes of getting governments, state agencies or private sector to understand how important this is, um, please share any experience, any anecdotes that you might have. Marisol. Thank you so much. Effectively, in 2001, the Cordillera Sul National Park was created, and then in 2005, the National Conservation Area, Sierra Sul, was also created. Both protected areas were created inside the Quichua territory, but without any consent, any, any free, prior, and informed consent. They did not ask the consent of Quichua peoples for them to come here. So the thing is that we were taken they took away our ancestral territory. We didn't have, we don't have the free transit in that area. We cannot even get closer to one kil one kilometer closer to that area. So for us, 
we are very concerned because what has happened is that, for example, my brothers, when they go to do some hunting, people get their the meat that they retrieved out of their hands and burn them. They take away our food. We go to the rivers, we go to the forest, and we retrieve fish and meat, everything that we need to work, do everything that we need to to nurture our family. So the people who have created this, this preserved area is the Peruvian government. The Peruvian government do not respect the international, the international conventions, the international agreements. They, they are taking away rights out of indigenous peoples. And now they're telling us that we cannot have have we cannot have free transit in their areas because the law of protected areas protect the areas and in the constitution they tell us that we cannot come in. But there was not free prior and informed consent. Why this hasn't been done in the beginning? So now we have a historical fight because in the case of Sara Escalera is it's been years and in the Cordillera Sul National Park it's been tw more than 20 years of fighting so we need that safety that legal safety so we can feel that we can make decisions on that matter but they never had our consent in the first place here in San Martin in Peru we are facing this wave not only Quechua peoples, but also the Shipibo Conibo communities, the Carawayo the Carawai community, they never receive free prior and free concern either. So we are affected by this because if they have had respected this consent, we wouldn't be in this situation. Because the only thing we need, we want, is to retrieve or get back our good living and we want our rights to be recognized, the land rights and territorial rights, and for governance as well to be respected and to safeguard the integrity of indigenous peoples. But for that, we have to ask, I cannot go into a house just because I want to, and just because I represent the state. We have to start respecting we are human beings, indigenous peoples are human beings, and we have rights under the international human rights. But it, at some point, they did not apply the free prior informed consent to us. Thank you. Yeah, that's very sobering. Thank you for that, Marisol. Um, Levi, we've heard about a lot of the problems. Do you have any positive examples that, and experiences that you could share on the FPEG? Thank you. Our experience here in Costa Rica and our work as the Mesoamerican Alliance, well, we do believe that free consent is crucial for several reasons. First, because it allows us to conceptualize forests from an indigenous perspective. It is a more spiritual perspective, not a commercial perspective like the carbon market shows us. Also, the funding that comes from the carbon market has to be distributed, just as we do in our system. Also, it needs to create a system for creating consent and and free consent. We cannot use a single way for every single people because every for every people consent is different. Territories have a lot to do with protecting sacred spaces and making sure that uh, we are aware. It also allows for us to have a bigger participation from the part of women, the elderly and the youth. This can be achieved through free consent. Account deeper topics like 
like our legal safety, like the recognition of our territories. We need to ha have our traditions recognized. We need to stop being criminalized. We need to start defining the property of of um, the different carbons. This is something we are well on our way with in Costa Rica with our program. Hemos trabajado con los liderazgos de la región una propuesta de siete ejes a desarrollar y lo estamos proponiendo ante los estándares de certificación que logren consolidar estos derechos de créditos de carbono. Y have recognized through certification de alta integridad en cuanto a los puntos que that I've mentioned will be taken into account. I do hope that every single country will be able to successfully implement this kind of um, this kind of project with um, with free and informed consent. But if not, the the people in charge of certification should be the ones who should be um, stepping up and dealing with this issue. And um, for actually sharing some of the positive, um, you know, outcomes and aspects of the Costa Rican example. Marco, what about um, in Guatemala? Um, what are some of the experiences around the free, prior and informed consent? Gracias, Tim. Okay. Um, Merci beaucoup. I would like to use my time reviewing some of the conditions in which some of the situation in which free consent is important. So th some factors to take into account are historical factors, current situation, as well as historical perception of indigenous communities. Historically, indigenous communities have been left aside from decision making regarding their own territories. And this has marked indigenous peoples regarding requesting of consent because most of uh, the successes have gone through have been achieved through fighting and nowadays the situation hasn't changed quite yet some successes have been won but the challenges are still there and we are still fighting to be recognized as people with rights Communities have also created some their own initiatives and their own proposals. The third element would be perception. Often communities perceive projects such as carbon trading as, as inherently not trustworthy. And for us, that means that consent is absolutely crucial in order to have a legitimate participation for indigenous communities. For example, in Guatemala with um, forest incentives. For us, it was very important to guarantee that communities would be assured the legal tenancy of the land. And nowadays, it was successful. Now it is a reality. So nowadays, in order to achieve this forest incentives, they need to certify their, um, they will be recognized as stewards of the forest. And this has been the result of our fight. This is not something this is not just a space that was created by the space, but it was a fight so that we could have this right. 
Thanks, Marco. Good to hear that there are some successes What's and 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 response uh, to the push as well. Um, now we have a final round of question before we open the the floor to Q and A. And I'd actually like Catherine to come in as well to answer this. But Marco, I'd like to ask you to 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 start this final round of question. And this is actually based on on an example that you know that that I learned uh, recently while talking to a researcher. Um, and they've interviewed farmers in South America who were involved who are still currently involved in a carbon offset project. Now, the farmers were not told um, of what the project was about or how much the offsets are being sold and to whom. They were asked to sign a single sheet of paper um, and they had very little idea of how the data about their farms, their practices and the offsets that they, their practices have generated are being used. So I'm really keen to hear your feedback on such an example or any other examples that you may have encountered where how do we make sure that you know indigenous peoples and local communities can own the data their own data or at least know what is being used for when it comes to these projects marco can i ask you to start first yeah marco empieza Regarding what you're mentioning, this is a quite common situation in different communities. This is caused by the lack of open spaces for indigenous people accessing information. In Guatemala, the emission reduction process, a process that has taken a long time to put into in, into work. Currently, we do not have all the facts regarding the implementation and limit, there's limited community from indigenous communities. And that makes it so that the indigenous people in the local communities who at the end of the day are the stewards of the forest is quite limited. Their intervention is quite limited. From our community, we have been trying to implement projects to make sure that everyone has a fair, fair access to information. And countries are also responsible of making sure that everyone has access to this information. And in Guatemala, that has a lot to do with um, the Escazú Pact, for example to uh, a pack which would make sure that uh, access to information and informed consent would be a right. As uh, from our community, this would be within the TAIC, um, the TAIC system, which would allow us to systematize information and make sure that the information is um, contextualized and so that it can be given in our own native language in a way that allows communities to have full access to this information. For us, that is absolutely key to make sure participation is full. And this kind of processes will help this kinds of issues that happen when indigenous peoples don't have the capabilities of participating fully. Thank you, gracias, Marco. Marisol, um, your thoughts? Hola. Sí, bueno. Hello. Here, we are awfully worried because the Peruvian state does not have a clear position on carbon trading. So we have here businessmen coming here and offering people and they tell they tell the people that they're going to earn a lot of money from selling this carbon trading. But we're not quite sure what a carbon credit is, what carbon trading is. The only thing we know is that companies 
are using our forests to wash their image. We do not believe that nature-based solutions and carbon training are quite real. We're not aware of how much is going to be paid, how it's going to work. We do not have access to this information. We cannot take perfect decisions because we do not have the right to the territory to take decisions upon. We have been thrown away from the land and that's why we are not considered part of decision-making spaces. And we have been receiving people asking us for our deeds and individual and collective land deeds. And we were able to to tell the to go to the um, to the ministry, and we were able to see we were able to see that they were just people that were trying to come here that were trying to come here and scam us. They were trying to green to mind with this green green gold. They were trying to, they were to the point that they, that they were taken, their deeds were taken from them and they couldn't carry out their daily activities. They couldn't plant their plantains, they couldn't plant their own yucca because that land was part of the database. This is not something that you are told, you are given a document to sign, but we are not given the information, we're not being told. We're just put, being put the bag of money in front of our eyes, but there, we're not being explained the, the details. And in the end, we are assigned things that aren't great for us. But here, we understand that in order to to be able to do carbon training, first we need to be a steward of the territory so that we have the administration, so that we ourselves can decide what we are selling, how we are selling. Thank you. Thank you, Marisol. Um, I realize that we have quite a lot of questions, but I also really want Levi and Catherine uh, to talk about essentially, you know, making sure that people have ownership of data. So can we very quickly go to Levi? Levi, I'm so sorry to rush you, but if you can keep your answer concise and then we'll go to Catherine and then we'll take the questions because we have quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, Levi, on data and ownership of data. Levi, sur les données et la propriété des données. Si tu peux faire référence à ça, s'il te plaît. Merci. Donc, sur ce sujet, j'ai deux commentaires à faire. D'une part, d'une part, et les stratégies n'ont pas marché. Si les certifications que l'on cherche ne marchent pas, il y aurait probablement encountering an environmental fraud that is torturing indigenous peoples. If the regulatory measures are failing, then we have a huge threat, not just environment and climate change, but our peoples. That's my first comment. My second comment is concerning why it's difficult to explain this to communities. It is really difficult because to explain ocean layer, the cars, smokes, the markets, the businesses, the integrity, what is integrity, what is the COP, it's really, really difficult to explain that to the communities. So the businesses who go and try to deal with this, try to trick people in order to accomplish their goals. And this is something really well explained by my by my, my colleague here. 
I believe it's a global environmental fraud. That's how I call it. So we're looking for alternatives. The free prior informed consent, consent, it's really, really important. Not just in Costa Rica, we use mediators, cultural mediators who can understand this and pass it along to, it, to the peoples in their language and make them understand what they're looking for me. This is really important. So effectively, indeed, there are two strength there are two things happening in the in the indigenous peoples first the incapacity of governments and businesses of not applying free and for prior informed consent and the second one is the irresponsible interest of some businesses to wash their sins their uh, environmental sins I, I call it that way um, so i wanted to address these two topics to avoid environmental chaos and genocide because they are taking away their livelihoods the the ways the ways of uh, sustaining life in different ways thank you so much thank you levy um catherine um would like to actually hear some of your thoughts uh with regards to data and ownership before we open the floor yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just be really brief. I think the other speakers have done a really excellent job of explaining the issues here and, and um, providing powerful examples. Um, just from the legal perspective, you know, the free, prior, and informed consent, you know, each of those words has a, 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 um, a particular content that's super important. And so when we looked at the, in, the informed aspect of this, um, it really has to be a fulsome and robust and comprehensive um, provision of information. So, you know, um, the communities that are dealing with this have to be informed of all of the aspects of the of the project, the context, um, all of the, the details, the nitty gritty, and, you know, this has to be provided in an accessible way. Um, as the other speakers mentioned, it has to be information that makes sense to the communities. And this example of cultural mediators is a really good one um, in language that they can um, in in their language, obviously, um, and in a time frame that makes sense with respect to certain cultural processes and decision making processes. So all of these aspects are are really really important if you actually want to have genuine, free, prior, and informed consent. Um, and then just very quickly uh, with respect to the data point, um, it it brings to mind this important concept of um, and developing con concept of indigenous data governance and. Um, data sovereignty, which really concerns um, Indigenous peoples' rights and interests in data and in their control of data, which you know, data that concerns them and um, to which they are linked. And so I think this anecdote um, then that you that you share really raises important issues with respect to data sovereignty and um, and the carbon market. Thank, Thank you. you, Catherine. Now we have quite a few questions, so we're going to move on to Q and A. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, throw out three questions and then we're going to go to each of the speakers and ask them to very briefly either answer them, um, uh, answer, you know, whichever question that they want to, to answer from, from this list. Um, there's a question that says, excellent presentations, thank you. So to our panelists, thank you very much. Um, could you talk about whether you are using um, GIS technologies? So I think that's, a, you know, satellite uh, images, I'm assuming, to help you document and legalize land rights and to monitor threats. So that's one question. Um, another question is, have carbon markets brought any positive social impacts on the indigenous people and local communities with whom you've been working with? And if so, could you mention a couple of them? So, you know, we've been talking a lot about the problems. Are there any positives? I think Levy mentioned one, and I think Marco also talked about how they've been able to push back, but if there are any other examples, that would be great. And third, how could indigenous people be genuinely empowered to participate effectively um, in carbon markets? So that's three questions. One is, on whether you're using GIS um, to document and legalize land rights, any positive examples, and to empower them, what's the to be genuinely empowered? I mean, I think the the mention of cultural mediators it's it's great, but are there any other ways? Um, I wanted to 
Marisol, can I come to you first? If you want to answer any of these questions um, or all, but if you could keep your answers brief so that we can at least have another round of at least three more questions. Sure. Well, first we do the monitoring process, the monitoring indigenous process. We do this by foot. You know, communities and some local communities and indigenous people do not have electricity. They cannot use phones. We have to walk. We have to walk a lot to be effective. That's how we call it. The effective protection. We have to walk 15 days, 30 days in our territories because it's true that people protecting the protected areas, they do it through satellites, but they do not report it. They do not um they, they keep selling this image to businesses saying, this is a green image and there's a lot of exploitation behind it of illegal logging in their own protected areas. So for us to make decisions in the carbon markets perspective, we have to resolve first the territorial aspect. They have to recognize first that we are the real owners and have that legal protection. And based on that, we can initiate some conversations about carbon markets and administration and regulations. In this, at this moment, we don't have that experience. And they don't consider indigenous people's owners. So we have to apply there the consent we can involve indigenous peoples. In the communities, they think that carbon is what they burn, the ashes. So we have to teach our brothers that they about this. They don't come and inform us in our own language. And that is a huge gap. Anybody can come and trick people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about empowering indigenous people, just um, letting the governments, yeah, ensuring that governments do their job and informing indigenous people as well, not in addition to empowering. Um, Levi, any thoughts on the tech, uh, uh, any of the questions around the technologies, um, positive examples and the empowerment? See, uh, well, yes. Well, concerning technology, I'd like to say that it's being used slowly in these matters. And because it's because the indigenous peoples are always left behind in that access of technology by the government. So the creation of capacities we can find it in our own territories but technology sometimes can, we can't in costa rica from 1997 the indigenous peoples have received environmental payments because of our forests because of our services we ask we are at the same level we are at the level where the government says this is investment of the government, but it's not an investment. This is something that we create. This is incomes that we create. So I think uh, an aspect of a, a positive act, aspect of carbon markets and resolving the issue that government sees this as an, inver an investment and they don't longer want to support us economically. So the carbon markets can support this, support it in that way. So concerning the consent, consent is not just for businesses. It's for us as well, as peoples. And if we can make collective effort involving the elderly, women, different groups, and we can focalize what we want as peoples, that will empower us. Besides money and economically positions that we can find, we can move in that matter through that way. Thank you. Thank you, Alevi. Um, Catherine, any, do you want to take or respond to any of those questions? Sure, I'll just, 
Oh, thank you. Sure. I'll just respond to the question about benefits, potential benefits of the carbon markets just quickly. Um, you know, if carbon markets and the, the intense interest in carbon markets do push governments to clarify legal rights um, and do push governments to clarify legal frameworks um, and tenure rights, then that is a potential benefit, obviously. Um, the, there's also a risk there at the exact same time, however, because as there's more and more attention paid to these kinds of nature-based solutions, then there's obviously um, can be a, a large disincentive to governments to even further dispossess Indigenous peoples and local communities from their lands and from their rights, because suddenly there is a value greater value attached to this. And so um, I just wanted to mention that, that there's a, a, a potential benefit there that could um, that could have um, overflow benefits in other areas um, with respect to Indigenous rights, but there's a risk. And so really need to keep the pressure on governments and keep the attention on these aspects of, of legal rights and tenor rights and carbon rights. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Marco, um, would you like to, to touch on any of those uh, answer and, and, and respond to any of those points and questions? Yes. I think I would only add a positive aspect, not just about carbon markets, but the climate finance specifically. For indigenous peoples and local communities, a good outcome of this finance is the dignification of the work that indigenous peoples are doing currently when it comes to the protection of their forests. At the end of the day, those are the communities, those are the peoples who are protecting the huge diversity in our territories. That is, this is, this Ironically, these are the communities who are being affected by a, sift, a system that don't provide access to education and information. They are like the last people to be considered in, politic, in public policy. So from, I think they can decide conditions for the indigenous peoples to decide on their own development. We see currently in the country different experiences where indigenous peoples have been able to establish their own hydroelectric systems in their own communities through a sustainable process without environmental impact, lacking a response from the government. Communities have established their own community tourism, groups of women, groups of youth who are being entrepreneurs in their in their lands. So they boost equ uh, equality. So they have to really consider the rights of indigenous peoples. One of them is free prior informed consent, uh, legitimate participation of indigenous peoples, not just seeing uh, indigenous peoples as another image, but they it has to be legally binding to include indigenous peoples. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I realize that we are actually running out of time. We have in fact ran out of time, but we have we considering that we still have over 400 people in the webinar and many more questions. If you don't mind, I would just take just the next few minutes to take three more questions. And what I would like to ask the speakers is to actually only answer one, only answer one as your last point and please keep it concise. Um, and those three questions are whether there are any examples to ensure that governments or state agencies recognize the indigenous peoples and local communities right in carbon trading. So have you been able to get governments to recognize this? So that if, if so, can you give an example? That's one question. Another is beside the F at the FPIC and the formal recognition of land tenure, what other aspects are there are crucial to guarantee a more equitable implementation of these kind of projects? And third is carbon credit presents a question around bundle of rights, and it's not just indigenous people and local communities who have those rights. So others share that as well. So how will this be managed? So I would like to ask speakers to answer only one out of these three questions as their final comments before we close. And I'm going to do ladies first. So Marisol, 
Um, would you mind starting, please, uh, very concisely? And then we'll move on to Catherine, Marco, and Levy uh, for final thoughts. Solo para comentar de que si realmente queremos. So I like to mention that we want specific results and that if we want to face climate change, we need to start by recognizing indigenous rights like any other rights and start recognizing their government and allowing them to be part of decision taking and only then we'll be able to create real nature-based solutions because we are the ones who know the actual solutions that have been transmitted generation through generation. Taking care of nature is not just a responsibility for indigenous people, but a shared responsibility for humanity because every day we are generating carbon footprint and keeping our planet alive for the next generation is part of our responsibility. Great. Catherine? Catherine? Hi, yes, just um, very briefly, um, I'll answer the first question with respect to um, carbon rights being recognized um, and just sort of globally, um, there are there are countries in which um, carbon rights have been explicitly recognized and defined in law. Um, uh, the vast majority of countries know that isn't the case, but there are a few select countries. Um, and then it's really a question of who is recognized as being the legal owners of those rights. And I, we do have a few countries in which carbon rights are explicitly defined in the law and that, that, that those rights to carbon can be tied to community land um, and forest ownership. And those countries specifically are Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Peru. Um, so those rights exist that then the question of course is whether or not they um, are enforced and whether or not um, they are respected so thank you great thanks for those examples uh, Marco perhaps as a closure I would like to give a very a specific idea We need real commitment, not just from state, but also from the civil society. Commitments regarding how we are going to compensate the work that our communities have been carrying out for not just decades, but always using their conception of Mother Earth. We know the realities and how to fight climate change and its effects. To be from the basis of considering indigenous people as people with rights. We also need, absolutely need the recognition of ownership and stewardship of the land by indigenous people. We need explicit recognition of uh, indigenous peoples as being the historic owners of this land. Thank you so much, um, Marco. Levi, Would final thoughts, and um, if you want to answer any of the, the, the questions as well, thank you. Sí, eh... La gobernanza de los pueblos indígenas. Governance for indigenous peoples must be strengthened from the communities towards the governments, because our governments have very different conditions and the situation is also very different between countries. So the strengthness must come from the communities. The carbon market is strengthening some rights, but it's mostly making it clearly clear that we need to improve our rights. And I would like to close with a specific country, with a specific question I was asked. Our certain axes are, have as an objective of improving the standards that haven't been achieved up until now in this, uh, that we've been speaking about in this webinar.
Muchas gracias, Levy. Unfortunately, we have um, gone quite over time. And thank you so much for your patience and staying with us. And I do apologize that we were not able to get to all of the questions, but it's great to see all the discussions going on and the interest in this. And I hope you know this conversation will continue, but we have to close the webinar now. Um, really appreciate all the speakers and the panelists, and of course yourself, the audience also for staying with us past the time. Can we give a virtual round of applause to our panelists uh, and the speakers, please? And of course, thank you also to our hosts, the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and the Thompson Reuters Foundation. It's been a real pleasure for me to moderate this event. Have a great day, afternoon, evening, or night. Goodbye.